hearing from God. This morning, we're going to continue that series, Jesus, uh, Follow Me. And so, or not Jesus, follow me, follow me, uh, follow after Jesus. And so uh, we, we opened up that, that series saying, hey, as we continue to look at the words and the life of Jesus, we're going to be challenged, encouraged, and inspired to go after him, to say after this weekend, a message to say yes to him in new ways. And whenever we do, it's always going to be better for us because it's all going to be for God's glory. We looked at Jesus uh, as a child, exemplifying to us as a body of what it looks like to be hungry for God. And Jesus, as a little kid, sitting in the temple, wanting to receive more, asking questions, giving answers, and seeking God. He, said, he told his parents, you know, where do you think I would be? I would be in my father's house. And it's a challenge to us as a believers what it looks like to be hungry, seeking after him, learning more of him, always in that mode. And last week we looked at Jesus turning water into wine, and then we saw these beautiful pictures of Jesus, that Jesus was the obedient son. He was only after what the, uh, what the Father wanted him to do, that he was the ultimate sacrifice. He used those cleansing uh, jars to turn, it into, uh, turn the water into wine, representing him being the ultimate uh, purification. And then he was also proven to be the all-providing bridegroom. That in moments where we fall short, uh, like that, that husband there, the first day, first marriage, and he already fell short. It was already a lesson that, hey, as humans, we, we, we lack. But God is there, Jesus is there to cover our lack and to be that all-providing bridegroom. And so we should go after him and, and ask of him of all that we need, and he provides it for us. This morning, we're going to continue in the life of Christ and look at Matthew's chapter 3. I remember there was a, a moment when I was young, uh, I had a lot of different friends in the neighborhood, and one of my favorite things to do living in Southern California was to go catch lizards, um, and with lizards and spiders and crab, any creepy crawly thing, I mean, me and my buddies, we would enjoy. And then it wasn't, uh, I don't know what grade we were in, that we learned that if you use a magnifying glass, uh, you can actually start fires with the magnifying glass, but we would we would uh, you know pop ants with these magnifying glasses, and so there was not did anybody else do that? Nobody else. Okay, all right, all right. There you go, Joey. Right. <laughs> so we we found the magnifying glass, and we could we could get the sun to focus right anyway, and it gets pretty hot. So we were out there one day, and uh, we were by we, we had these little picnic table areas, and um, we're about there. It was me, my buddy Alex, and Frankie. We were um, down on the ground and we had the magnifying glass and we were like we were popping the ants. And in Southern California, it's a dry climate, right? We, we know, we see on the news all the time, wildfires and things of that nature. We didn't really, we, we didn't really think about all those things, you know, when we're out there, you little boy, just, you know, have fun. But we're popping the ants and then a military police officer uh, came around the corner and we're kind of off in, anyway. I can see the whole scene right now in my head. But uh, the military cop kind of come over and he comes up to us and he's, he asks us, you know, what are you guys doing? We're like, oh, we're, we're popping ants. Like, no, you weren't. I saw those sparks. It did create a little bit of a, a spark, you know, when we did it. Uh, and he said, he goes, you guys are starting fires. This is dangerous. You know, uh, the, it's the middle of summertime, right? We weren't in school at the time. This is dangerous what you guys are doing. You can start fire. Don't you guys know this? And, you know, really laying it into us, you know, and, and then he asked this question at the very end of the whole thing. He said, where do you guys live? And so my buddy Alex, he made up some address, and, and Frankie, Frankie, he made up some address, and I was like, I live at, I don't remember the house number, but 123 Culver House uh, Lane, and he goes, what, what it was, Culver House. And uh, he's like, all right, I'm going to talk to your parents, you know, he it was really official. He looked like he was writing down everything. I don't even know. Did he ever come back? I don't think he came to the house. But uh, my buddies, right afterwards, they, they all nudged me, and they're like, what are you doing? Why should you give him your address? I mean, like, he's gonna, we're going to get in trouble. We're going to get we're gonna get caught for this, right? And uh, I remember responding to him. I was like, well, I was just doing what's right. Like, that's that's what you're supposed to do. Like, he he's an official. I, I'm at, he asked me, you know, I, I gave him my address. I didn't think... I didn't think anything of it. In Jesus' life, there's many moments, and this moment that we're looking at today, moments where Jesus was doing what's right, 
what should be done. And so this morning we're going to look at Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. It's Jesus' baptism. And I don't know about you, I've asked this question before, and all this week I was talking with Pastor about this, I was talking with friends, I said, why did Jesus get baptized? And we're going to look today, I hope that we receive some truth about why Jesus got baptized, but then again, I think it also will challenge us and encourage us to follow after Jesus in doing what is right. And so Matthew chapter 3, we're going to look at verse 13 through 17, and it says this, Then Jesus came to Galilee, to the Jordan, to John, to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, or John, yeah, John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. Do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for this is fitting. Some version will say, this is right for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw a spirit of God descending like a dove, and the coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Let's pray this morning. Father, I am grateful for your word. I, I am grateful, Holy Spirit, that you are here, that you have been sent to guide us into all truth. So this morning, I pray that our ears would be open, Father, that our hearts would be right and ready to receive what you have for us. May your word change us and challenge us. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus comes to John. John is uh, ministering in baptism. He's ministering in baptism of repentance. It's a, it's a baptism uh, to turn away from what is wrong, what is sinful in your life. It's a turn away and a dedication to God. It was a preparing the way. In Isaiah 40, it was John was there. He was preparing the way for the Messiah. And the way for the Messiah was a way of repentance. It was a way of turning to God with our hearts. It wasn't one that was done by things that were accomplished or actions that were accomplished. But no, it was a position of the heart that was taken when they repented to God. We know this as, as believers. When we repent, right, it's not just a behavioral change. If it was a behavioral change alone, then man, it, it would be really quick. Things would be over quickly. But no, we know that at, when we repent, it has to be a change of mind, a change of heart, a decision in our, in our heart to submit to the ways of God and to his decrees. So why did Jesus get baptized if Jesus was sinless? Well, here we're going to give two reasons. As you look in Scripture, and as I was studying this week, I mean, I was finding there was all sorts of different things. And I was trying to look, I was trying to cross-reference. I don't know if you guys like cross-references when you're studying your Bible. Look up, okay, if this verse says this, then where else in the Bible is this written? And, and so I was thinking, you know, if Jesus is doing something to fulfill righteousness, where was, where was it decreed that righteous, you know, that this was a righteous act before Jesus did it? Searching scripture, but I, I, I settled on two areas this morning that I want to highlight to you why Jesus, why Jesus would need to be baptized, or why Jesus went to this ascent to get to, to John to get baptized. And the, the first one that I saw was that there was a presentation, it was a presentation of the Messiah. So in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, this is John the Baptist's ministry. John the Baptist was the voice crying in the wilderness to prepare the way for the Messiah. So as John the Baptist, the, the crazy man he was, uh, wearing, eating locusts, wearing camel's hair, we're going to read the rest of this uh, process, uh, the rest of this chapter here shortly. But John was the one, he was preparing for the Messiah. He was getting ready for this coming king. 
the one that was going to overthrow the government, the one that was going to bring the kingdom of God, the one that is going to establish all things and forgive the world of this sin. Jesus was coming, the Messiah was coming, and, and his baptism was a repentance of, of saying, oh, I'm going to not lean on my own ways, I'm not going to lean on Jewish tradition, no, I'm going to repent of these things, and I'm going to follow after, uh, be ready for the Messiah's coming. In John, uh, I'm sorry, in Matthew chapter 3, John predicted Jesus' coming. So right before this, in verse 11, he says this, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, greater than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So when, when John is baptizing everybody, he's saying, hey, get ready, the Messiah is coming. Repent of your sins. Turn your hearts towards him. And then Jesus comes. Why does John uh, uh, submit to baptize the Jews? Because Jesus is the very one that he was preparing for. And there is this, there is this presentation of the Messiah. There is this baptizing. This is the man that, uh, that we have been waiting for. This is he who we've been waiting for. And he baptizes them as a, as a presentation of, this is the guy, this is the one. And so Jesus is saying, this is going to fulfill all righteousness. This is him pointing to the fact that he is the Messiah. He is the one that they've been repenting towards. He is the one that they've been turning their hearts toward. And John then gets the opportunity, not just to be the voice in the wilderness saying, hey, he is coming, repent. No, this is the one. He is the Messiah. Second kind of picture that we see here is the presentation of the sacrifice. When the priests would go into the temples to, uh, to make the sacrifice, the lamb that was slain or the lamb that was going to be used for the sacrifice was examined. It had to, it, there, had to be, there was qualifications of this lamb. It had to be pure. There had to be no blemish about it. And they would present this lamb before heading to sacrifice. John himself has a unique background, that John was not just um, somebody called, but there was in the tribes of Israel, there was the tribe of Levi, and the Levites were ones that took this priestly office. And it was amazing now that after Christ died and rose again, that now we are all of priesthood, right, in, in Christ Jesus. So there's, there's no specific bloodline of priesthood that we need to follow. But in this moment, in this, um, sorry, leading up to that ultimate sacrifice, Jesus, there was a tribe of Israel. And so John was a, was a descendant of Aaron. So in Luke chapter 1, verse 5, it was really important that John was, uh, John was in, the, in the lineage of the Levite, of a priestly, of a priestly caste, of a priestly tribe. And so this being... So, in John chapter 1, recording this baptism, John chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist is one saying, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so again, in the first one, he's presenting the Messiah, lining up with what the Matthew was saying, but in John, taking on this thing, that this is the ultimate sacrifice. This is the lamb that was prophesied about. This is the pure uh, lamb. And so there's this, this whole kind of ceremony in Jesus' baptism of saying, man, this is Jesus. This is Jesus. This is the lamb. This is the one that's going to take away. It's a foreshadowing metaphor here that Jesus was the one. It's a presentation there. And I look at those different reasons. I'm like, oh, this is this is great. This is this is wonderful. This kind of shows how Jesus is fulfilling righteousness and doing so. This is this is fitting that he be presented as the Messiah. This is fitting that he would be the one that is a sacrificial lamb that takes away the sins of the world. But as I look back, as I as I take the lens back and I step and I look at the context, I think there's an even bigger reason why, there's a bigger presentation of his righteousness, there's a bigger reason why this is fitting, or this was right for Jesus to be sacrificed, or Jesus to be baptized in this moment. And so let's read, let's look here, 
the, the previous uh, section of scripture, Matthew chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 7. There's a larger contrast between Jesus and the religious leaders that is that it flows through the story of Jesus' baptism. And I think when we look at this larger contrast, and then we see the affirmation of the Father at the end of his baptism, it, it will speak to us this morning of how we can follow after Jesus, how our lives can also reflect this Son of God. So Matthew chapter 3, verse 7, it says this, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, this is John the Baptist, he's out there baptizing people for repentance, and people would come out to the, to the river, come to, out to hear John the Baptist speak, and, and his followers were growing. And so then the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they began to come out. And it says this, they, they saw the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, and he said to them, You broad of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to rise up children from Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with an unquenchable fire. Talk about a rebuke. The religious leaders coming out to John the Baptist, ready to take part in this religious ceremony. It's the popular thing to do right now. It's the way of repentance. This is something that I need to take part in. And they come out to take part in another ritual. Another daily degree, another check mark on their list, another notch in their belt. Hey, we're going to go down and we're going to get baptized. And immediately the Spirit of God prompts John the Baptist and says, They're not ready. You brought a Bible. Why are you coming down to get baptized? Why do you think this is something special? This is not some ritual that's going to be passed down or has been passed down for generations. This isn't something just to, to, to do. No, this is a, a moment of repentance. I'm loving uh, this opportunity that I have as a father with my son and teaching him the things of God. It was about two weeks ago, he uh, filled up the bathtub uh, up to uh, higher than he normally does, and he calls Mom and I, Rachel and I, in there. He goes, Mom, Dad, come in. And so we're like, all right. And usually he, he's still really, really awesome. He'll, he'll ask us to come in and check how much soap he's using, you know, to, to wash his hair and stuff, you know. But this moment, he, he goes, Mom, Dad, come here. And he has the water, and he's like, Dad, can you baptize me? And I was like, oh yeah, I mean, I would love to baptize you. I said, well, you know, why do you want to get baptized? They said, well, Jesus is awesome. I said, I said, I agree, Jesus is really awesome. And I said, well, tell me more about that. Why, why do you think Jesus is so awesome? And you guys know, as, as children, sometimes, sometimes raising your kids, you have those moments of like, oh, they're getting it, and then it like changes really quickly. And so Jesus, he, Denver goes, yeah, Jesus is awesome. He tastes like cotton candy, and I just love him. I said, okay, I, I think there's some more theological steps we need to, we need to take here before we, before we baptize you, buddy, that you can fully understand what you're doing. But, you know, even in his, even in his childlike thing, trying to describe how Jesus is to him and, and the moments of prayer that we have as a family, he's like, man, Jesus is so awesome, he's like cotton candy. I said, okay, there's some more theological foundations, you know, framework that we need to lay a little bit about this amazing opportunity to have to die to yourself and to, to live for Jesus. But, man, he's, he's getting it, he's getting it. But we see this contrast here between the Pharisees, they're coming down, they're just, they're, just wanting, they're just wanting to do another right. And then Jesus coming and saying, 
to be baptized, it would be fitting because it would fulfill all righteousness. We see on the other end of Jesus' baptism, instead of a rebuke, an affirmation of this moment. The voice from heaven, the spirit descending on him, the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son who I am well pleased. Now, I know I, I've preached sermons before, and I've encouraged them, and this is an amazing moment because it was before Jesus' public, public ministry started. It was before he did anything for God uh, outwardly. Uh, Jesus, uh, God affirming his son, saying, no, I am well pleased with who you are, not with what, what you've done. And I think that also speaks to us as believers. He, God affirms us, and God is for us. God is, his love is for us, whether no matter what we've done. No matter what we've achieved, you know, this religious leaders they come, they got another check mark, they did another thing, they, they, they're ready, they're, they're doing things for God. But in Jesus here, if we look at his life, he was one that was fully submitted to the Father's will. And even at the end of his life, we see Jesus as this fully God and fully man, talking to God, knowing that what was to come, the cross, what in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? The cross was to come, the torture was to come, the sacrifice was to come. He knew his purpose, he knew why he was sent. And even in that moment saying, Lord, Father, if you would let this cup pass for me, let it come, let it, let it pass. But Lord, Father, not my will, but your will. And I believe a really significant part of Jesus being baptized is this contrast between the Pharisees who are looking just to get another check mark, looking just to, hey, continue on this fame of Abraham. We are, we are Abraham's descendants. This is what's right to do. This is the favor. We're going to take part in it. And, and John the Baptist rebuking them and saying, no, it's not about the lineage of Abraham. And it's not about your religious right. No, it's about a heart thing. It's a, con it's a condition of your heart that you repent to him and you turn fully to him, not relying on the works that you've done, but relying on him. There's coming a time where there's a God who's going to judge and he's going to be able to divide the works that you've done to the very bones and marrow of who you are by his word and know you. And it's coming. The judgment. And Jesus, I can't, I can't separate Jesus getting baptized from this, from this moment here where he again repents. Jesus repents. What? He leaves his life and submits all of his life to the Father and his way. I lay it down. I have to be, I have to repent. I have to turn away from my own life and my own desires because I know what I'm going to step into, Father, is your will and your way in every moment of my life. How does this, how, how, Andrew, what are, you, what are you saying about this? You see, Jesus gets baptized. He says, no, not my way. God, it's for your righteousness. It's a way, the way of righteousness is that I lay down everything, all that I want, all that I desire, Father, for your way. And the Father then replies to him, I'm pleased with your son. Yes, hallelujah. I'm not pleased just with the outward things. I'm not pleased with the religious leaders. I'm not pleased with your church attendance. I'm not pleased with your amounts of Bible memorization you've done. I'm not pleased with any work. No, I'm pleased with that heart, my son, that you said, I'm willing to lay everything down as a way of righteousness. Amen. As a way of what's right. Andrew, how does the scripture confirm that? Immediately after this moment, this is going to be our next portion of scripture we're going to foreshadow into next week. We're going to talk about Jesus' temptation. But Jesus' temptation is at that very root. Jesus, the enemy coming and tempting. Jesus, are you submitted to the way of the Father? Jesus, is your heart fully committed to what the Father would have you do and only what the Father would have you do? 
The enemy comes out of him. Hey, I can give you this. Hey, you can do this. Hey, prove this. And all of it is here at this temptation of, is your heart, is your heart fully submitted to the Father? Andrew, you could, this, is second, this is the second week in a row you're mentioning, third week in a row you're mentioning submitting everything to the Father. This is the way of Christ. That's right. This is the way of righteousness. That I get out of the way and I say, yes, Father, what is, what is it that you would have me to do in this moment? It's fitting that I am baptized. It will fulfill all righteousness. It will lead to a heart of submission <coughs> to the ways of the Father. This morning, for us, it's that same question, it's that same privilege, it's that same uh, uh, request from the Father. Uh, will you submit all of who you are? Lay down your flesh. We know this is also a foreshadowing of baptism that we take in Romans. It says that when we go down in the waters, we are dying to self and we're rising again to live a new life in Christ Jesus. Right? Lord, help us. Lord, help me. Lord, strengthen me. Jesus, you... You did it over and over. You did the right thing. Man, I can remember, you know, as a kid in the, that moment, and I told him the address, you did the right thing. Man, sometimes, you know, I'm like, there wasn't a precedent to what he was doing, but then what he did, he brought through a powerful truth. And it's not about what we do. It's not the actions we accomplish for God. It's the submission of our heart to say, yes, God, whatever you want. And then the Father looks on us, not because what Jesus just did, but his heart, and says, this is my son, who I'm well pleased. This morning, I believe the Lord would say that to us this morning as well. Man, I am well pleased with your heart. I'm well pleased with your submission. This, this weekend we heard, not only was it a challenge to say yes to God in every way, but it was a challenge to endure in that. And that's, this morning, the encouragement this morning is to continue on that, in that, to continue to walk in that. Jesus, next week, we'll see, he walked that out. He walked out what it meant to be submitted to the Father. When the temptations came, man, he walked it out. And we're going to learn how Scripture and how the body encourages us that we can continue to walk this out a heart that is submitted completely to the Father. This morning, I don't know where each one of us are at, but I know a few of us this morning are like, yes, I mean, bring it on. Jesus, what would you have me to do? Father, show me what you want. I'm willing. I'm surrendered. And I want to encourage you to keep on in that. Keep on having that heart. Have that heart that says, God, no matter what you ask of me, my answer is yes. My answer is, Lord, I will do whatever. I will go wherever, whatever you ask of me. Keep on it. And keep on it. Our life in this world is going to be maybe full of challenges to that very quest of our heart. It's going to be full of challenge, full of opportunity for us to go our own way or do our own thing. But the Father said this morning, man, I am well pleased with those whose hearts say, all for you. It's not about an act, it's about a heart. This morning, I want to close in a time of prayer again and dedicating our heart to say, yes, Lord. Yes, Father. Whatever you want. Whatever you want. All for your glory. All for righteousness. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, I am grateful this morning again to come before your church and present your words. Jesus, you are wonderful and magnificent. You are holy and you are above all things. And you showed us the ways of righteousness. Lord, it isn't like the Pharisees or the Sadducees that 
or out to accomplish another feat, out to gain another notch in their belt, out to do a ceremony. No, you were pleased with the heart of your son to die to self and to live for your glory. Lord, I pray for all of us, God, that we would be strengthened in our innermost being to continue on the journey of saying no to our flesh and saying yes to you, Lord. God, we know that in doing so, Father Lord, we may not please men, but we would please the heart of our Father. May that be our heart and desire. In Jesus' name.